Thank you very much, Jintana, and um, <clears throat> a great pleasure to be here as always. And I too would like to express my condolences for the recent passing of the King of Thailand. So I was invited to give a um, tough talk, uh, strategies towards curing HIV in people who start ART late. It's not an area that I've worked on directly, nor is it is a very understudied area. But in preparing the talk, I really um, came to the conclusion of how important um, this really is, and that the news is not all bad. I don't think we have to assume instantly that cure will occur more readily in early treatment than in late treatment. So this is a nice summary, I think, of what you've heard earlier. Um, I've adapted it from a slide from Steve Deeks, and it first of all says, tries to summarise the likelihood of HIV remission or post-treatment control based on, when you, based on when you might initiate ART. And I think the short answer is we don't really know the best time to which, um, at which we will achieve post-treatment control. You've heard already that as you start treatment later, the amount of HIV DNA is increased, but whether that is the true important latent reservoir remains unclear. We know that in very early ART, again, as you've heard a lot today, it's a much smaller reservoir, you have intact lymph node architecture, but there is limited adaptive immunity because of perhaps limited exposure to HIV antigens, and in some individuals, no antibodies at all, which may be a good thing in that people don't seroconvert, but could potentially be um, a disadvantaged thing in that you don't have any antibodies to HIV. In late ART, you've heard already that we have have larger reservoir, possibility of immune escape, T cells are exhausted, there's tissue fibrosis and inflammation. But somewhere in between there is a time at which we need to know at what time we need to start ART to achieve post-treatment control. The largest group of post-treatment controllers um, described to date are the Visconti cohort, who did start in acute infection, but not in very early um, uh, acute infection, within the first six months of infection. So I'm going to talk about some of the issues for cure when ART is started late. That's the size and distribution of the reservoir, the impaired immunity and why that's important. So the impact of current strategies for cure in late ART, and then some of the specific risks and considerations we need to consider for the future. So a few caveats. Uh, what do we, how do we define late ART? Does that just mean in Thailand or in Bangkok, late ART means starting treatment, you know, after 72 hours of infection? I've begun to learn over the last few days hearing the heroic efforts of the search team here. But is it just, does this just mean chronic infection? Should we define it by the nadir CD4 being less than 200 or even 350? Or is it, are we talking about individuals who have opportunistic infections or AIDS defining malignancy? Uh, as Irene already said, most observational interventional studies for cure have pretty much just compared ART in acute and chronic infection and haven't gone into the detail of people who start ART late. And no studies have really asked the question of the effects of an um, AIDS-defining illness or very low CD4 count in the interventional studies. So I'm going to limit my um, summary to studies in chronic infection and, and try and highlight the role of nadir or current CD4 in understanding the reservoir. So first of all, the size and distribution of the reservoir. The first person that really looked at this um, very systematically was Nicola in a very important paper, now seven years old. But he really, he and together with Rafiq Sekuli, really showed this very strong relationship between integrated HIV DNA and nadir CD4 T cell count. If you start treatment late, you have a lot more integrated DNA in your CD4 T cells in blood. At the same time, you also have a very strong inverse relationship between integrated HIV DNA and current CD4 T cell count. So reconstitution is also important. Not everyone with a low nadir ends up with a low uh, current CD4 T cell count. And Nicola also showed the distribution was quite different. In people with low CD4 T cell counts, most of the virus was in transitional memory or short-lived T cells, which could potentially be advantageous, compared to people with high CD4 T cell counts, which where the virus was predominantly in central memory T cells. 
We've done a lot of work also with Nicola and Steve Deeks and Rafiq and others looking at the relationship of inflammation and HIV persistence. Many other groups have done that. This is just recent data looking in tissue, the rectum and lymph node where you see this very strong relationship between integrated HIV DNA and the proportion of activated CD8 T cells. And lots of other groups have shown this for many other markers of immune activation. But these are intimately tied up to CD4 T cell count because if you have a low CD4 T cell count, you have high infl inflammation. We've got a lot better at characterising the virus than just looking at integrated HIV DNA. And that is the idea that a lot of the DNA that we measure is, you could think of it as junk DNA or defective DNA. And the person that's really led this effort is um, Bob Silicano. And it's summarised here where he um, classifies virus as being the total number of infected cells on the far, um, on the far right. Uh, in chronic HIV infection, the number of gag positive proviruses was just a little bit of the um, a little bit of the virus. Then he looks at intact proviruses, the number of viruses that are capable of producing infectious virus, and then measures infectious virus IUPM. And you can see in chronic infection, you have far fewer intact proviruses. So a lot of the DNA, total DNA, integrated DNA, has a lot of defective virus that probably isn't going to cause much damage. So recently, um, Bob Silcano's group looked at whether you see the same if you treat an acute infection. And actually what's interesting here is, yes, you do. You see that these mutations or defective viruses accumulate quite quickly and that um, it, there are similar frequency of intact genomes following treatment of acute and chronic infection. But if you look at the absolute numbers of um, infectious virus measured by IUPM and intact proviruses between people treated following chronic infection and acute infection, this is not super acute, this is within the, within the first six months, there's smaller amounts of infectious virus and acute infection, but the differences are not huge, probably less than a log when you look at intact virus and infectious virus. There's also this idea that virus persists on ART by something called clonal expansion. I think you're going to hear a lot more about this, and it's highly relevant when we talk about treating cure strategies in late ART. So in someone that's viremic um, off ART, if you look at the integration sites where the virus integrates, it's randomly distributed and there's no preference and almost every virus has a unique integration site. Several years ago, a number of groups showed that if you looked on ART, you see expansion of what are called identical clones. So you see expansion of virus that's integrated in exactly the same site, which says it's not multiple infection events. These cells must be proliferating and expanding. And cells can proliferate and expand for a number of reasons. It might be because of the site of integration, may drive expansion. It might be because they're antigen-specific T cells responding to HIV, or it could be something which is called homeostatic proliferation, usually driven by IL-7, which we see a lot more of when you have low CD4 T cell counts. When you start treatment late, you have a lot of homeostatic proliferation, which would favour clonal expansion of these specific um, cells with a specific integration site. Now is that good or bad? It's quite controversial whether the, these expanded clones contain infectious virus or not. Recent really interesting paper from Michelle Nusenzweig's group that looked at the relationship between the size of an expanded clone and the likelihood of that virus, that, that infected cell releasing virus. And what they found was that in the very large expanded clone, there was a much less lower chance of this clone releasing virus compared to when you have a smaller expanded clone. So these clones may be expanding in the background, contributing to these high levels of DNA, but how relevant that is for infectious virus is unclear. Finally, we know that the reservoir is not just all about T cells, there's also infected macrophages. Again, a controversial area. You heard some really nice work from Serena and the role of CNS macrophages. But we know that in these animal models of both mice and monkeys, that if you infect in the absence of T cells, virus preferentially goes into macrophages, which would be an issue for individuals who start treatment late. <coughs> 
What about um, impaired immunity? Um, again, you heard this really well summarised by Liddy, but there's a few features of impaired immunity that are very relevant to HIV persistence. We know that CD8 T cells are important to controlling the virus, even on antiretroviral therapy. And the direct evidence for this came from a monkey study led by Guido Silvestri, who took monkeys on stable ART, gave an anti-CD8 antibody, shown there in a green arrow, and then was able to show that you got viral release or increase in viral replication. So the CD8 T cells, even on ART, are playing a role. And here you can see plasma SIV RNA before the antibody was given, um, after the antibody was depleted, and then after CD8 reconstitution. So effective CD8 T cells are important for the control of the reservoir on ART. We know that um, there's immune escape and that there's also um, immune dysfunction of CD8 T cells in HIV infected individuals on antiretroviral therapy and that will need to be addressed in people who start ART late. And we also know that exhausted CD8 and CD4 T cells are relevant because they predict the time to viral rebound. Now this data actually comes from Spartac, where ART was started within six months of infection, so it's an acute infection cohort. But the investigators looked at the, the time to viral rebound or the duration of remission in relationship to how exhausted someone's T cells were before they started antiretroviral therapy. And on the left, in the red line, you can see how quickly someone rebounded if their CD in PD-1 was high on CD4 count compared to PD-1 that was low in the blue line. And on the right, the same data for CD8, high and low. And we know that in, in late infection, you have even more PD-1 higher cells, and similar patterns were seen with other exhaustion markers. So this means before you even start antiretroviral therapy, the more exhausted CD4 and CD8 T cells you have, the quicker you will rebound when you stop antiretroviral therapy. What about um, the impact of current st strategies for cure in people who start ART late? So as Nicola summarised already, the principal strategies we're trying to use here are to reduce persistent virus and increase immunity. One of the main ways we've <clears throat> so far tackled the issue of persistent virus once it's established is with latency reversal that Nicola really nicely introduced. This is a summary of all the latency reversing agent studies that have been done in chronic infections so far using HDAC inhibitors that I know this audience has heard lots about, um, AKT activated disulfiram and PKC agonists. And you can see here that the CD4 inclusion criteria for every one of these studies has required a high CD4 count of greater than 300 and many of them greater than 500. So we really haven't tested any of these strategies yet in people who have um, um, poor or low um, reconstitution. However, uh, if you look ex vivo, um, there's some emerging data that you might have an enhanced response of latency reversing agents with a larger reservoir. Uh, this data comes from Corinne Van Lint and she took T cells from HIV infected individuals on antiretroviral therapy and stimulated those cells ex vivo with latency reversing agents and saw that the, if people had more a larger reservoir, there was a more increased likelihood of um, activation. We also know from some recent monkey studies when you use T the TLR7 agonists, which can also act as a latency reversing agent, that these drugs may potentially look very different in treated chronic compared to treated acute infection. The first data of this agent, the Gilead produces a TLR7 agonist now in clinical trials in HIV infected individuals, was tested in SIV infected monkeys with chronic disease. And you could see on the left placebo, on the right what happened when you gave the TLR7 agonist, and you see very good latency reversal or blips in virus after you gave the TLR7 agonist. But in a follow-up study that was really looking at vaccination, but if you look at the TLR7 agonist alone, and these are monkeys treated an acute infection, you see virtually no response to the TLR7 agonist shown here down on the lower right hand um, corner. So the response to latency reversing agents may be very different in treated acute and chronic infection.
We have to worry about what these latency reversing agents are doing on T cell function. Many groups have no, now shown that HJAC inhibitors, but also PKC agonists, can reduce CD8 T cell function, and I think this will be quite problematic in people who start ART late who already have exhausted T cells. What about on the other side of the coin about immunity? We know that vaccination in general, the response rates are poorer with people with low CD4 T cell counts. Most of the therapeutic vaccination studies and broadly neutralising antibody studies to date have been done in people with high CD4 T cell counts. But one um, area that might be relevant for people who start ART, low, ART late is when you use strategies to reduce inflammation. These have been reviewed already, um, strategies like cytokines, strategies to reduce proliferation, targeting in the interferon pathway and other pathways. And I've summarised here some of the strategies that are being tested in either animal models or in clinical trials. They're the ones that are underlined. So far, none of these studies that have um, been completed had yet shown an effect on the reservoir. But some very interesting new work um, in animal models on the interferon pathway. These are two recent studies published in the Journal of Clinical Investigation looking at what happens when you block type 1 interferon on the HIV reservoir in a mouse model. And we know that in late AR, in people who start ART late, interferon or ongoing interferon stimulation is very significant. And in both of these studies, antibodies to the interferon receptor, these are now um, in clinical trial for SLE, in an HIV positive model on ART, reduced immune activation, enhanced T cell function, reduced the reservoir, and in one of these studies there was um, uh, measured time to viral rebound off ART. So targeting this interferon pathway will be something you'll hear a lot more about and I think is relevant to people who start ART late. Finally, immune checkpoint blockade. Nicola mentioned this earlier and it, in its role of these drugs to reverse latency, but really the main role of these drugs in cancer and we hope in HIV will be to reinvigorate T cells. This is how they're important. Exhausted T cells express immune checkpoint markers like PD-1. They bind to their ligand, PDL one and it maintains the T cell in this quiescent form. If you block that interaction, it can reinvigorate um, cytotoxic T cell function in both cancer, HIV, Hep C and Hepatitis B. Those drugs are now also in the clinic, licensed for melanoma and non-small cell lung cancer, bladder cancer, drugs that block PD-1, PD-L1 and CTLA-4. And these drugs will probably be, be the first drugs that will be evaluated as a cure strategy in people with low CD4 T cell count. The only clinical trials at the moment of anti-PD-1 and anti-CTLA-4 are being done in the setting of malignancy uh, for AIDS-defining or non-AIDS-defining illnesses. These are two clinical trials currently enrolling, um, one sponsored by Merck, the other BMS. And actually enrolment is stratified by CD4 T cell count because these will be the individuals with those malignancies. And we're involved in uh, reservoir sub-studies of both of these um, clinical trials and it may um, address this issue of, of, of activity in high or low um, CD4 T cell counts. And it's possible that the drugs may even be safer to administer in the setting of low T cell counts due to the issues or complications of autoimmunity. There are many other observational studies looking at immune checkpoint blockers as they're being used clinically. We have an observational study being done across Australia, but there are others I know of in France and in the US as well. Finally, what are some of the specific risks of cure studies in people who start ART late or things we should be thinking about? First of all, obviously treatment interruption. This has become the preferred and um, important clinical endpoint for many of our cure studies. And I think many of our ethics committees are very comfortable with approving antiretroviral treatment interruption in someone who has a high CD4 who has a high, who never had a low nadir CD4 T cell count. But we know that low nadir CD4 is a high risk in treatment interruption for clinical events and may not really be possible in people who start ART late. 
Co-infections, as you heard about, may be, might be important for reservoir size, but they're very relevant to multiple interventions. We know that many DNA viruses uh, respond to HDAC inhibitors, for example, like CMV, EBV, JC virus, hepatitis B, all which would be exclusions for participation in HDAC inhibitor studies. And other immunotherapy will also affect um, potentially even enhanced response um, to other co-infections. Polypharmacy and drug drug interactions will further complicate some of the cure interventions. And I think um, the engagement in clinical trials of people who start ART late will be very different to those that, who start ART very early. Their scientific literacy, their appetite for risk or benefit, and their understanding and perception of cure. So in summary, um, late initiation of ART is associated clearly with a larger reservoir, whether that's a larger functional reservoir um, or replication competent virus, still an active area investigation, different distribution of the virus, impaired immunity and inflammation, which all is, favours HIV persistence. Some incure interventions may potentially have a greater activity in individuals who initiate ART, ART late. Emerging data that LRAs and anti-inflammatory strategies may have some greater activity. Um, interventions such as immune checkpoint blockade will actually first be assessed in individuals with low CD4 count and could potentially have reduced toxicity in this setting. And finally, I think individuals who initiate ART late should not be excluded from CURE studies. They may present some unique opportunities to examine interventions. They also present some specific risks that need to be considered in CURE trial design. I just want to acknowledge um, a lot of collaborators and funders who support um, our work in Melbourne, particularly the Australian Government, NHMRC, National Institutes of Health and the American Foundation for AIDS Research. And finally, if you're interested in some really simple and accessible knowledge um, about HIV cure, particularly for your patients, this is a website that we've recently developed in collaboration with the Kirby Institute, the Alfred Hospital, and National Association of People Living with HIV and AIDS in Australia. It's particularly written for patients to learn more about cure, so some of your patients may be interested in seeing this as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.